Um, so this is a fucking wild. I don't know how I found this. This is a wild, wild story. And I think this might top uh, all the what the hells we've done because this just blew my fucking mind. Judgment right now. Because we In have. In the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you. Dude, Dude I, I, I didn't know who don't, to don't, thank don't, don't for that, with the but now that I know, I, I'm so grateful. <laughs> yep, that's Praise it. Our, our, our vaccines Praise have come in from be. the one and Bless only, the, fruit. the one and only <laughs> Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> Fuck that guy. Um, <laughs> is, is, is Kenneth Copeland... Um, is that is is Righteous Gems a parody of him and the, and his family? Righteous Gemstones. Uh, it righteous is. Gemstones. It is. It is. Yeah, I guess like technically, kind of, it is. Um. Uh. Yeah. Uh. That song, that metal version of Kenneth Copeland. I want to give some credit here to where credit is due. That comes from Andre Antunsi. I hope I got that right. Um, and, uh, uh, one of our patrons or one of our listeners actually sent that our way. Um, so thank you for sending that to us. And if you want to send us anything at all, letters at sickboypodcast.com. But the reason I wanted to play that at the, st- at the top of the, the show today, the boys, the boys got the fucking vaccine, baby. We we're, did. We're yeah. vaxxed, waxed, and ready to fuck as Tay says. As the kids say. Waxed and ready to fuck. Yeah, dog. How how good did it feel for you guys? Because I know that the night before, I w- like almost couldn't sleep with excitement because I, it was kind of like Christmas morning, especially because you know we all got vaccinated in the morning. So Jerry, you and I were like at nine twenty in the morning, and I think Taylor, you were around eight a.m. eight thirty, and uh, and it was it was like so exciting because I knew time, that like when I set time. my alarm. And woke up in the morning, I was going to the hospital to get a COVID-19 vaccination, which felt like a long time coming, you guys. Yeah, um, I was I was sitting. So I got my I got the I got the shot. And then, you know, they bring you to the waiting area where you sit for 15 minutes. And uh, and somebody that I know from uh, from teaching at the yoga studio sat down across from me. I hadn't seen him in a really long time. And I was like, Hey man, what's going on? And we, we ended up having a really, really nice chat. And we, we talked about like this, how surreal the moment is, but also like how anticlimactic the whole thing is, because it's like, since the, since the, you know, the shit hit the fan last year, you know, we've been like, everything's been building to the moment where you can, where you can get the solution to the problem. And like, this is Mm -hmm. the solution to the problem. And that's like, mm-hmm. that's just that. And, um, and <clears throat> Neil deGrasse Tyson said something recently that I heard him say, which was something along the lines of like, you know, science doesn't care if you agree with it or not, because it, it, it doesn't make it false. Right. And, and this is the solution to the problem. So anyway, we were sitting there and, uh, and we were talking about how like anticlimactic it was to get this shot because you know, you go in, you sit down, the person goes, you know, Hey, you know, this is the things, these are just like some possible side effects that you might feel today or tomorrow, <clears throat> blah, 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 blah. Here's when you're second, you know, you can bump uh, all the little things, the housekeeping and like really midway through doing that, they poke you in the arm, like pretty much while they're saying that. And then you, and then you're, and then you're gone and you're in mm. a waiting room and you, and this moment that's been building up for so long is come and gone. And, and, and so he was sitting, he was sitting across from me and he was like, man, I feel like, you you build this up in your head. You feel like there should be 
there should be someone taking photos. There should be like, <laughs> yeah. there should be people like lining, <laughs> lining the room, giving you hot, like giving you hand slaps as you come by and like, and like the crowd roaring. Yeah. And there should be somebody that's selling you. That's like, you know, selling you, you know, a photo that they took of you. They're like, Hey, I'll, I'll for a hundred dollars, I can send you a framed photo yeah. of this. Like there should yeah. be, it should be like getting off a roller coaster. It, there should have, you know, they sell sh- you merch. Bri, you were right about that. There should have been luchadors. Cause I went to the Halifax Metro, the Halifax forum. Perfect place for luchadors to be running around, like you know, <laughs> giving people right. fucking choke slams and shit. But but Tay, you and I were talking about this uh, a couple of days ago. This, we had this exact conversation, and my thing was, yes, the 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 vaccine itself, the poke itself, was a little bit anticlimactic. But I think that moment that you are talking about will be the moment, and we and you know, for some folks listening to this, they might have already had that moment, especially down in the U.S. because we're seeing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that one for us will be, I think when we like attend an event that is like full of fucking humans, you know, like mm-hmm. go to a, a music festival, mm-hmm. you know, go see an F1 event. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe just, oh, okay. just, uh, just <laughs> something's just, on daddy's Christmas just list. Just that out there. Um, <laughs> but the, like that, you know, for us, I think that's like, that is the, the, the climax is like, finally we are fucking surrounded by strangers we are not yeah. distancing ourselves. We are fucking raging, like listening to a dude play heavy metal with Kenneth Copeland yelling at us like that. That is dude, the fucking the, climax. The 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 poke itself is like a, the montage scene, you know, like Ooh. in the yeah. movie yeah, of like yeah. the COVID pandemic, the montage, there's like a montage scene of everybody getting yes, the poke. Dude, yeah. And then the scene after that is people raging at yeah. a concert. And we're not yeah. we're not at that point yet. Some people yeah. are. But I, f- I fucking can't. I'm picturing, wait uh, that I'm day. picturing like a really, a really nice, a really fun and intense Guy Ritchie montage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of <laughs> montages and speaking of film, this is a great segue. Um, have are are either of you familiar with this film right here? Um, and folks, I haven't seen it yet. Folks who are no. just listening, uh, if you want to see what we're looking at right now, you can go to YouTube because all of our Feel Good Friday episodes are now on YouTube. We're looking at the poster mm-hmm. for Clint Eastwood's film called The Mule. Mm-hmm. Now, The Mule actor. is a film that is based off a true story. Um, quick synopsis. It's about a guy who's like in his 80s who through a series of like unfortunate events, I guess, gets tied in with the Sinaloa cart Sinaloa? Sinaloa cartel? Yeah. Sinola yep. Sinaloa. I think it's Sinola. Sinaloa. Sinaloa. Sinaloa drug cartel. I have it written right. Let's here. just go with that. Um, Sal, if you said that confidently, Jerry. I know. Yeah. I would yeah, would just yeah. would have been yeah, fine. Should have <laughs> stuck with it. So the movie is actually based off this guy named Leo Sharp, um, who whose whose name also was known as El Tata. And uh, Leo or El Tata was uh, was an American World War II vet, uh, a horticulturalist, horticulturist, uh, and and also ap- happened to be a drug courier for the Sino- Sinaloa car- drug cartel. So super fascinating fucking story, where in October 20, 2011, while he was in possession of 200 kilograms of cocaine, he was 87 years old. He got, a, he got arrested by a trooper, uh, Craig Zysena, from the Michigan State Police during a coordinated arrest operation by the DEA. See, when I hear that, I go, ah, man, whatever. Like, it, I'm not surprised because if I was 87 years old, there's probably not, not a lot of crimes right, really, that, I, that I would be, that I would not be deterred from committing because like lifetime in jail at that point could be like as short as like six months. You know, if well, you're on your way out, 87 yeah. years old committing that crime, yeah. like what's the deterrent? Yeah. <laughs> life Plus in jail. If it, if it happened, already lived if it a happened full life. in 1950 or later, Brian's not surprised. By it. Like, <laughs> yeah. It just right. doesn't like <laughs> anything that took place after 1950 yeah. is Brian just goes, yeah, that makes sense. I'm so, saying I would consider being a drug mule if I was 87 years old. I'm so, just saying, yeah, because fuck it, because fuck it. <laughs> so in the movie, they go into the reasons why he got into it, and it had to do with like, 
you know, get, getting money for his family. Um, his wife was dead. He didn't have much to live for. Yeah, I get it. But okay. I totally get it. All right. So, <laughs> so the the I'll, I'll tell you the 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 whole in in and out of that case. The criminal investigation was prosecuted by Assistant United States Attorney Chris uh, Graveline in the Eastern District of Michigan, culminating with indictments of 25 members of the organization, including Sharp. So a bunch of people got busted. Uh, Sharp was allowed to speak at his sentencing hearing before Judge Edmonds. He addressed the judge and said, quote, I'm really heartbroken, heartbroken I did what I did, but it's done. In an effort to avoid jail, Sharp made one final strange plea. So again, just to remind you, he's a, a horticulture, horticulturist. My God, that fucking word. <laughs> um, he said, he, he, he basically said if he could avoid jail, he proposed paying the $500,000 penalty that he owed the government by growing Hawaiian papayas. Quote, he was quoted saying, it's so sweet and delicious. He's a really like cute old man, right? Um, he, the court he would have to just be. like, just yeah. like Clint, yeah. just like Clint. <laughs> so the court, um, ultimately denied the offer, um, and sentenced him to, to how long do you think his sentencing was for, for being busted with selling again, 200, uh, 200 kilograms years. of Coke. All right. So, so which works out to be 440 pounds of cocaine. Death. Uh, eight years. Death. Uh, he eight got years. probably a, Probably like a hundred years or some crazy shit like that. He was sentenced to three years in prison. Whoa, what? His defense. So lifetime at that age. I mean, at that age, yeah. His defense <laughs> His defense stated that Sharp had dementia and would do poorly in prison. And Sharp was released in 2015 due to declining health after only serving one year in prison. Okay. So laying all that out, why am I talking about Leo Sharp, a.k.a. Um, El Tata? Well, when that movie came out, um, it came out not long after a local story that came out of here in Nova Scotia, one that was very similar to that story. There was way a Nova too similar, way too similar. So there was a Nova Scotia cocaine smuggler who um, uh, his name was Jacques Jean Grenier, and he was a sailboat captain, and he got busted for. Uh, twenty million dollars worth of cocaine. Whoa! So there's a there's a tie in here. Five grams. There's a, yeah. There's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Canadian or American? Uh, I think we're talking about Canadian Canadian dollars. That's an so, eight ball of coke. So um, uh, there is a tie in as to why this is relevant to Sick Boy right now. Um, I want to read to you uh, a, a bit from a, a Saltwater article that came out by Chris Lambie. Um, just a couple of weeks ago. And this was sent to me by someone who I, who I know who's pretty close to me, who's a lawyer. Uh, I don't know if I can say who this person's the lawyer of, but let's say... You know, I, don't think, I don't think you should. I don't think I should <laughs> either. You just, you just, I don't think yeah. I should yeah. leave it alone. Let's Maybe just you say, should ask your lawyer before you <laughs> decide. I don't, I don't want to be murdered. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's just say that this lawyer uh, is very close to this case. We'll put it that way. Um... So a sailboat captain in his early 70s caught smuggling $20 million worth of cocaine from the Caribbean to Nova Scotia, can't get the treatment that he wants for his cancer in prison, and doesn't qualify for early release, according to a new parole board decision. Jean-Jacques Grenier applied for day parole to get alternative treatment for his basal cell carcinoma, according to a new decision from the Parole Board of Canada. He also wanted out of prison due to the risk of contracting COVID-19 behind bars. So this guy's sick. He's got cancer. He wants to seek this alternative treatment and is also worried he's going to get COVID. Mm -hmm. Quote, the board does not believe there's sufficient information to, to, to conclude that in either case, your risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus or the treatment of your basal cell carcinoma your continued incarceration would seriously damage your physical or mental health. So, so the parole board's like, we don't believe that this serves a risk to you. And we don't believe that this, this treatment that you're seeking is, is worth us giving you day parole. Uh, the parole board goes on to say, quote, for all these reasons, the board takes no action on your application for day parole by exception. The board has determined that your physical or mental health is not likely to suffer serious damage. If you continue to be held in confinement, Granier has been, quote, battling this disease for much of his adult life. However, 
It appears to be worsening at the present time. He wanted to get out of prison. So this was the treatment. He wanted to get out of prison so he could be treated with CBD oil. The cannabinoid is a marijuana derivative. I think most of us know that. Uh, used to treat pain along with many other ailments. But it's a treatment that cannot be used or accessed within the prison oh. that he is being held in. Quote, That's interesting. They go on to say, in regards to your basal cell carcinoma, the nurse practitioner at the institution reports that your oncologist is recommending that you have facial surgery, but you have refused such treatment and wish to be treated by CBD oil, which you cannot access at the institution. The nurse practitioner mm. reports that your oncologist does not support the treatment of your cancer with CBD oil. The nurse practitioner further indicates that you would have the same access to treatment recommended by the oncologist, which is facial surgery, for your basal cell carcinoma in the institution as you would out in the community. Um, and so, so basically, they, they basically said, no, fuck you. Like, you want this alternative treatment. We're not going to give it to you. You're going to stay in jail. And is that because it's, it's it, classified as a drug? I mean, it has to be classified as some type of it's drug still cannabinoid. within that like world of the prison system, I guess. I, so they I would, don't say, yeah. It. I mean, you, you can't have weed, you can't have marijuana in the prison system, uh, or, or, you know, within a prison. So I'm guessing that that would fall under, you know, it under it that. It seems like something that just needs to be caught up with the with the with the rest of what's going on. Yeah. In, at least in it the is world interesting and though, specifically our country. <clears throat> It is interesting though, because I mean, obviously we don't have the full picture of, of this story, but like the fact that they said the treatment wouldn't be recommended to somebody who is outside of the institution as well. Like, it, like, is there, you know, is that valid? I mean, we're, we're taking the lawyer slash this uh, inmate's word that this is going to be a, a worthwhile treatment over the nurse practitioners word that is saying that the oncologist wouldn't even recommend this. So well, do well, we know that I mean, the treatment, I, I mean, I, I'm all I, for I advocating think, for, for treatments that could potentially benefit a patient, but at the same time, like, see, here's the I thing, think right? listen to the medical pra I, practitioner I too. I think it's less about that and more about the fact that, you know, I, I think here's what I think. If someone has a disease and someone's trying to manage that disease, someone also should have the right to choose the treatments that they want to manage that disease. So like our friend Leighton, you know, when he was getting coffee enemas and juice cleanses, mm. I guarantee you his fucking oncologist didn't say, I recommend that this is the route you go. Mm -hmm. They might not, they might have said, you know, I, I don't see a problem why you should, shouldn't do this. But they they also were, you know, I, I doubt that they were like, go do the alternative treatment because like that's all you should do. I think this, you know, the guy the guy wants to try something other than whatever it is, facial surgery. And it's it, it is a bit baffling to me that. But they he's, don't but give he's him also the, in jail at the end I of the day. The and like, he, like I people, think, I mean, people, I just want to say like, like it would be nice that if somebody wanted to choose to have a nice dinner out at like a restaurant an expensive restaurant that it would be great if they had that choice. Inmates don't have that choice in jail because they're in jail serving time okay. for a crime that they committed. Yes. But, but <laughs> so the they don't have that question, choice to do, to, to do the, that thing. The question, the question is, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if something like this, um, you know, reached, um, you know, reached the highest courts in, in Canada as a, as a, as a, as a, as like a landmark case that demarcates, um, you know, where does the charter of rights and freedoms, uh, begin and end for somebody who is, who has committed a crime and has been put in prison because like you said, Jer, like somebody outside of prison can, 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 can choose their own path. Like they can take the recommendation of yeah. the physicians and the nurses and stuff that they see for their condition, or they can very freely choose to go and get whatever alternative treatment they may want to pursue as well. And so that is, and that's their right. And then the, so the question is somebody, in, somebody who's in prison is, okay, well they, they do, they, that's a right that they do not have. And where, you know, where is the, where is the clearly defined line in our justice and judicial system that says that they have given up that right as a result of committing a crime. And so 
That is, that is ultimately the question. I mean, do I think that it's outdated that they can't for access sure. CBD, yeah, which is a very, sure. which is a very like clearly defined yeah. um, treatment yeah. for lots of things, whether it's, whether for this thing specifically or not, it is a treatment, a medical treatment for lots of people. So I do think he should be able to access it. Um, I think the question is a very is a much greater legal rights and freedoms question so in our country. I, I want I want to just lay this out a little more context here. Um, so he was found. Basically, his crime was when he arrived in Nova Scotia about four years back. He didn't contact the officers with the the Canadian Border Agent Service Agency, who later showed up and found two hundred and seventy three kilos. So seventy three more kilos than uh, El Tata. Uh, of cocaine hidden in, in his <laughs> sailboat. Um, and, and his financial gain, they were, they, they worked out and found out was that he was getting paid between $2,000 and $2,500 per kilo. So, so that works out to be like, you know, over $600,000 worth of cocaine that he was smuggling into the country. However, he has, so again, we're talking about a, a guy in his like late seventies or, or I guess early seventies in this case. Um, he has no prior conviction on his record. And the other thing that I didn't mention was that his sentence. So El Tata was sentenced to three years in prison. Uh, Mr. Granier was sentenced to 13 years in prison, mm. which is, a, which yeah, is a, it, but it's, a life sentence for him. Right, for but sure, it's the, it's, it's Canada versus the United States too. So it's, I mean, it's two totally different legal systems, but I I just want to clarify that like, I'm not, I'm not opposed to advocating for the rights of people who are who are in jail. Like I, I think that they should have yes, equal right. access no, no. to to rights. I'm you, you know, I, let me, Brian. Let me we talked about this. We talked about this just, in the park earlier me, today, and you said me, you, you were me, like you were like we should this is where give him the lies about whatever. No, you were like we should give him. We should we should we should gas <laughs> him. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so Brian. anyway, um, so the point I'm trying to make is is that. You said, Jared, that people should be free to choose whatever treatments that they they want for their illness. I believe yes. that yes, with within a certain extent, because we talked about the like why why okay why so, within a certain why so within is, a certain extent. So, so this is why because people get taken advantage of. I don't think that okay. Listen, I I want to. It's hard because I believe that they should have the right to choose. Yes, but at the same time, there are people who get taken advantage of, like somebody who goes to Mexico to get treated for chronic Lyme for forty thousand dollars, and they're they're paying for this alternative treatment that is not going to do anything for but Brian, their health. But so, Brian, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about. No, uh, we're not talking about some treatment that is that is. We're talking at, about CBD. Yes, which I agree that if like CBD should be something that if the proof is there that it works in this case, it should the then the laws have to catch up to that. So yes, I agree with that. But like should like at what point do you no longer take medical practitioners' advice and start allowing people and paying for it um as a government for alternative therapies? Well, I got to well, say, I do have to say this, you, you, I mean, in reality, this man is in jail and, um, you know, there's, there, it is, it's very likely that if I, I know if I was in jail, I'd be looking for every way that I can, I get into the parole board to, to convince them that I need to get out, you know, like on a, on a fucking day pass whenever I can. So there is that to consider, but also the fact that it's just like a straight up no like to you know to to have this option for a treatment that is if it's like we're not going to bring it to you and we're also not going to allow you to to get it elsewhere like that to me is is just a little bit <laughs> fucked up um, what about the fact harsh. that he's not accepting the recommendation of the facial surgery as well i mean like i, I just that think plays, that there's that plays, it's too much of a gray it. area that we we don't understand like there's there's very intricate de- details to the situation that like we don't we don't have all of that information but my opinion I have is, all is the that, information like, I have I mean, all the information at the, at the end of the day <laughs> the, the, I'm leaning day, to supporting it, the healthcare but providers but I can't I can't talk about all the information because if I did I would, I would uh, legally I'd get a lot <laughs> at the of end of the day at the end of the day everybody it's it, it is it is a it is a question of where where does where is the line drawn on what rights and freedoms somebody who commits a crime in Canada uh, um, 
like pretty much voluntarily vacates. Um, Dude, you know, I think I think what, it's a, what I think they, it's a fucking. What do they give up? I think it's a straight and up. Where is that rate. line drawn now? I think where it's is a, that line drawn now, and where should it be drawn if it should be redrawn? I think it's a. I think it's just a just a standard human right to like. So, Jer, but Jer, my question is for you: is is so in terms of like uh, public health care? Um, do you believe that anybody, everybody, should have whatever option for treatment that they choose paid for by taxpayer money? This is a good point. The, the 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 fact that the fact that there is a a treatment that is that is recommended by a physician, and you know I don't know what the coverage whole situation is, but it is a good point. Like if if there is if there is things that are covered, um, and not co- like that's a that's a an interesting. But it's also that it. like it's not it's always very that the, the the treatments that are covered are necessarily right because sometimes there might be alter- yeah, that's like just, there yeah. will be situations where there there will be alternative therapies that might do less damage than an actual because I think of like um, patients going through severe rounds of chemotherapy or um, what's the the newer uh, cancer treatment the. Uh, that Brandon had it. It was like, like a, a immuno, experimental immunotherapy. Immunotherapy mm. um, that that like sometimes doesn't work for for patients, but wreaks a lot of havoc on their body. And they could have done something that might not have had a a, a positive effect either, but also <clears throat> wouldn't have had the same damaging effect. So there's like a lot of situations where like the medical ad- accepted advice might not necessarily be the best advice, but at the same time. <laughs> I think it's more likely that it is than not. I I just to wrap here, the one thing I want to say is that I am a fan of this Jerry new of word. this new Brian that we have seen over the last few weeks. This Brian that has lost all empathy, this Brian <laughs> this Brian who who poo-poos on the idea of, of preserving tattoos of loved ones if it makes someone feel good. This idea this Brian that that um, you know, thinks that the the, the poor girl uh, Hannah who can't burp, it just like really Come isn't suffering anything. To the dark side um, with me, and and the Brian <laughs> and the Brian that thinks this guy should just rot in jail without the treatment that you know, he that you he know truly the funny wants. Thing is- is that I think that if you dig deeper down, you'll realize that the reason why my stance is this way in this situation is because I believe that people are inherently good. And I believe that the nurse practitioner that's offering advice, the oncologists that are offering advice, I believe that they do have the guy's best interest at heart. And I believe that they are, they are good people. And I believe that he is probably less educated on the matter than they are. So they're making this choice in his best interest. And I support that. I, oh fuck, I don't know if I should say, I don't, I don't know if I should say this on the podcast or not, but I, I wonder if don't, we you could, can school me later. If, uh, I, I, if wonder, you, I wonder, if I wonder if we could get the, but I'm also, I'm also I wonder if we, I was going to say, I wonder if we can get the lawyer on, on the show to, to, to talk to us about what, what he thinks. I would be very the, fascinated from just getting the legal, getting the legal standpoint <clears throat> of why or why not he, he, why, why he can or can't access that treatment because there obviously is a, there is a legal foundation for why he's not being given, why yeah. he's not act, being able to mm. access it. And that is, I mean, th- this whole thing, I mean, Jerry, you can say yay and Brian, you can say nay. And the reality is, is that there is just an ocean of gray mm. in between you, you, both of you that is so hard to, you know, wrap our heads around because, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's a, it, it's a, it comes down to being a legal matter and yep. like, and legal, legal and legalities are not objective. They're completely subjective. I, I also don't think that, I, I don't think that my perspective is necessarily the right perspective to have in this situation. I'm asking the questions. I think there's a lot of information that we don't know. And like, that's why, like I sort of sit in this gray area where there's like, you know, Literally. I hear what you're saying and I care about the guy. I also think that the prison <laughs> system needs to be reformed Literally. and that I think that it just doesn't fucking, we don't actually rehabilitate people in jail anyway. Like we need to look to Scandinavia where they, in Norway, where they, they don't fucking punish people the same way that they do here. Yeah, and give, cook, give, give the, cooking classes give the prisoners and, and, yeah, and, exactly. and VR sets. Landscape give the, painting. Give the prison, give prisoners. Give prisoners. The prison system has to be video reformed. Games. But anyway, that's, that's what I think. Yeah, <laughs> I was just gonna say my my thing's like, wow, I'm really shocked that our prison system isn't very progressive. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And 13 years North America sounds like a, a fucking crazy, yeah. crazy amount of time for this crime. Like, I think that this guy got a <laughs> yeah, fucking... Dude. A shitty also, situation. Also, your whole yeah. point there, Bri, about like the like the U.S. Uh, and Canada, Bri, two different medical or two different law. Um, you uh, think thirteen years is too sh- is too long of a sentence for somebody who has taken drugs into a a, a, a specific drug that is I do. for I do. sure wreaking havoc on a ton of people's lives all over our province, and thirteen years is not an, is too much. I do. Yeah, because the cocaine I think that he, he has was brought a pawn into this. In that. That, that, Con into this. I'm not. Oh, dude, that's so. That's <laughs> that's so fucking. He's a pawn. Oh, all right, as let's, if he's just sitting we'll, around going like, "Oh my god!" Dude, he had no. He, just, he had no history of it. criminal records, so it feels and, like it yeah, feels he like never a lot. got I mean, caught doing I, it. I think and if also, you switch if you switch the sentences around for the guy in the states and the guy here in oh Canada, it would make more sense to me. I I mean, look, I don't know, I don't know shit about shit, but I bet you, I bet you, I bet you two hundred more love, guys. I bet you two hundred kilos <laughs> worth of cocaine that this was not the first time he's done this, and I also bet you that there <laughs> yeah. is a lot of money sitting somewhere uh, because. Um, well, little birdie told me that there's probably a lot of my city somewhere, and no one knows where it is. So anyway, yeah, it's moving in Oak, Oak Island, dude, it's a <laughs> yeah, fucking treasure. That's it. <laughs> yeah, that moving right. right along, uh, here is a sweet little update <laughs> from our um, our friend, the accessibility evangelical evangelist. Is that uh, what Lucy calls herself? The Lucy the, Greco. Yes. Yeah, Lucy yeah. Greco. Yeah. Um, Lucy Greco. If folks haven't uh, listened cousin to uh, David Greco, that's right. Maybe a stand up comedian. 100%. Um, Lucy was on the show uh, a couple of months back, and her whole thing was um, uh, the way we found Lucy was she was reviewing a washing machine from LG. And Lucy is blind, and Lucy was quite, uh, quite pissed about the washing machine she got from LG because. Uh, it, she couldn't use it. it. It was not accessible whatsoever. <clears throat> she made a video about it. The video went viral. She came on the podcast. We talked about accessibility. Lovely conversation. Highly suggest you go back and listen to it if you haven't. Uh, Lucy has updated the world on her YouTube channel about her uh, debacle with the LG washing machine. And here is a little clip from her YouTube channel with a little update as to what's happening. It was well worth it when we first got the machine as you may know from watching my initial know before you buy video i was not able to use it thanks to some work from lg and some support and communication from them we now have a machine that i am now able to independently do my own laundry and use this machine so let's start at the beginning The very first thing LG wanted to know was, would a Braille template help you? Would you be able to get around this machine with Braille on the machine? So they worked with an agency and created the initial Braille template. So let me describe this template to you. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of Braille on the left side of the knob. And the same amount again on the right. So uh, for folks who are just listening, um, we just saw there the uh, the Braille setup that LG has worked with Lucy in installing on her on her washing machine that gives her the ability to see all of the options that she can choose on her washer to make it easier for her to um, to use the fucking machine. And I was watching that video and that little template that she has there. It's like, again, if you, if you're not watching on YouTube, it, it looked like, um, sort of like, uh, how would you describe it? It was like, it was like laminated Braille that was like plastered onto the, the, the washing machine itself, which like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't look like if you went, went to buy a washer and you saw that on the washer, you'd be like, what the fuck is this? This is so weird. But it I looks was like, like Lucy got it made at like a local lamination. at like Staples. It looks like it looks like yeah. when you buy a TV at like at like the store and you go home and you have to peel that sticker, mm. the clear sticker off the screen. <laughs> it looks like that with bumps yeah. on it. But then I was thinking, <laughs> yeah. then I was thinking, what if she bought that washer and it had installed on the front plating 
that those exact bumps just the way they are. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, that or, would that or, would or, th- or it just came with a with a an optional sticker. Like or they st- all get yep. shipped with a yep. with a with a sticker that comes off of a of a back a back plate, and then yeah. you can stick it on. I mean that that is that is an option. But the, but this idea that I had of like of it actually being built into the plating itself is something that I was thinking about, like how. A for someone for me, I don't need that. I don't need braille on my on my washing machine. I can see it just fine right now. Fingers crossed. These fucking eyes don't get any worse than they already did. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about how that would actually look kind of. It would look kind of cool, you know, like it would look really neat, and it would be, and it wouldn't. I wouldn't fucking mind having it wouldn't those cool deter little, me from buying it. No, yeah. exactly, and like just an such an easy thing to incorporate into daily products that we see every day, right? Like it, I, I, one thing that, that, and I want to give a big shout out to uh, propeller brewing here in Halifax, they, their menus at the, at the pub, um, they've incorporated Braille into their menu. And it's, you know, it's just like every table has it. You, you, it's the same menu that we, that I would look at that anyone else would look at, but just hard built into the menu is Braille on it. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we've been having a lot of conversations recently about accessibility. We did a, uh, I think we talked about it on a recent episode or an episode to come about um, this, this event that we hosted for CBC about ex- accessibility um, in the world and how when we incorporate accessibility into the world it really is just better off for everyone. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, mm-hmm. it, it's not a hindrance to anyone it it only helps. It's only it only makes things better. And I'm seeing this video from Lucy. It just I I it dawned on me how I'm surprised how we don't have more Braille kind of just like built into things. You know, like it's it it there's a space for that. There's a space for that, and and it makes me kind of excited to think about a future where that's just more so like ingrained in products that that are put out there for people to just Mm -hmm. have and use and, you know, like adding a little bit of like a tactile thing that like you have on the products that you purchase that for, you know, for you and I, it wouldn't really make any difference to us, but for someone like Lucy, it would make a whole world of difference, you know? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because like, I think now after seeing that, if I went to buy a washer and there was like four options and I noticed that one of them had, braille on it even as somebody who who doesn't need that i feel like i feel like i would be more inclined to buy the one with braille because i'm looking and acknowledging at the fact that this company is supporting it like building more accessible products and it would be i would be more inclined to buy it um too so i think like there's there's even like the i mean accessibility is obviously the first priority but i feel like there's a a net gain for the the company to invest in developing that because they're reaching a larger market of people by making it more accessible. Yeah. And I mean, it's good for the brand to be that way too. It's good yeah. for the brand. It's good. It's good. Again, it's good for everyone. Like it doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't hinder. Like it only, it only improves. Yeah. So, uh, so Lucy, congratulations. Uh, LG, <clears throat> kudos to you. Uh, so nice to hear that a company heard uh, someone calling for help and, and actually did something about it. Yeah, that's a good, good like feel good Friday content right there. So thank well, you, Lucy. You know, like thank you, LG. Companies in general, and this really started. Um, this started. This started a, a few years ago, um, but it certainly accelerated after last May <sighs> and George Floyd and social issues like really coming to the forefront of of um, of society. Companies are there's a. For, speaking from like the uh, the sort of like financial seat that I sit in a lot of times, like companies used to be exclusively beholden to the shareholder. And that has been something that is like that has made a lot of people really rich and may and, and really done nothing for a lot of for a lot of people. And um, and now companies, there has been a shift in it and it's and it's accelerating where companies are way are so much more concerned about what what the general public think about their company and they are much more swayed by public opinion than they have ever been and so like except for amazon 
Except for Amazon. <laughs> Except Jeff Except for Bezos Amazon. does not give a flying <laughs> fuck. But, but we are, but we are entering <laughs> bit about We are I entering know, know, a funny. We're entering an era where where yeah. I think we will see a lot more mm. of like the, this sort of example, like a big uh-huh. company like LG, uh, you know, responding and and taking an action and like for a huge company fairly quickly. I mean, we talked to Lucy a few months ago uh-huh. and now there's been something that's been like an action that's been taken. So and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And I think I think public opinion um, holds a lot of, of power um, over companies that it didn't before that is, and we're going to see that, uh, we're going to see that, uh, play and take effect a lot more in the future. Maybe it's a bit cynical though, but I still feel like it's, it's motivated by financial gain. Um, JT Firstman just put it. Well, of course it is because uh, the public opinion is what makes them money. That is right. Exactly. But I think that that's why they prioritize it, which like it is a bit of of a cynical way to look at it, but it's, it's true. Um, but JT Firstman just put out a, did you guys see his, his video that he put out today? Um, like the fourth or fifth slide is, this is my impression of a corporation's tweet. <laughs> and it's no, like, no, yeah. just trying to be like <laughs> yeah. fucking young and hip yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. and yeah, it's, yeah. And inclusive. It's, but to uh, your point, like yeah, we, can, we, can, yeah. we can all tell the difference <laughs> when people are doing a, like slapping on accessibility at the very end, which like tell Jesus credit, ultimately they, they ended up doing in the same way that like we can like in that joke, we can make, we can tell the difference between people actually caring about social or companies actually caring about social issues versus trying to make a buck cynically by saying, Oh, we'll put a tweet out or, Oh, we'll do mm-hmm. this. Like when ex- that's real yeah. action. Yeah. When yeah. accessibility yeah. Yeah. is baked into the product from its, um, conception into the design phase, it makes a better product. Yeah. Like Lucy mm-hmm. said, yeah. totally when yeah. it's not an afterthought. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. the same thing with the, with issues in social justice. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. You're totally 100%, 100%. right. hundred percent. Um, all right, Tay, I know you got a, a, a bit of a hard out, so let's move right into this week's segment of what the hell? <laughs> I feel like that one was even That'll, better than normal. Yeah. That was better than normal, and it'll never get old. I love that. <laughs> um, so this is a fucking wild... I don't know how I found this. This is a wild, wild story, and I think this might top uh, all the what the hells we've done, because this just blew my fucking mind. This, this uh, story came out a while ago, um, fucking 10 years ago now, May, uh, May 2011. Uh, astonishing survival of soldier with unexploded bomb wedged inside his stomach after Afghanistan ambush. Sorry, can you say that again? Whoa, I will. <laughs> so Private Channing Moss, uh, 23, he was in an armored car that was hit by an RPG. Now, Look, the boys have been playing a lot of war zones, so I know the three of us know what an RPG <laughs> is. But for and when folks, you shoot it at a car, it fucking blows it, up. Yeah, it blows right up. Uh, for people who don't know what an RPG is, an RPG is a rocket propelled grenade. Okay, so it is a it is an explosive that is put into a device that propels a grenade on a fucking it's rocket. A ro- it's a rocket. It's a rocket launcher. It's a rocket launcher. Yeah, it's a bazooka. <laughs> it's a bazooka. <laughs> yeah. So um, so U.S. soldier uh, has told the astonishing story of how he survived being impaled by an unexploded bomb, which became lodged wow. into his abdomen during an ambush in Afghanistan. In Guys, a moment- let's just scrap this whole what the health and let's just get him on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> Is he alive? <laughs> Lauren? He is alive. We should definitely get him on the show. All right. That would yeah. be fucking, that would be tight. Dude, that's um, crazy. <laughs> so uh, in a moment of incredible human triumph, Private Channing Moss, 23, has walked to the podium to collect various awards, including the Purple Heart and the Medal of Valor since recovering from his ordeal. Private Moss was on patrol in Pak- Paktika province in eastern Afghanistan on Thursday, March 16th, when his unit was attacked likely by Al-Qaeda or Taliban insurgents, in a uh, mountainous region bordering Pakistan. Around 24 men from the 10th Mountain Division Alpha Company were driving a convoy of five Humvee armored vehicles and a pickup truck containing Afghan Afghan National Army troops when they were hit first by gunfire and then a hail of rocket-propelled grenades, RPGs. The pickup truck exploded, killing two of the Afghan soldiers, and as the rocket struck Moss's Humvee, 
the gunner recalls being thrown against the wall of the vehicle. And he was quoted saying, I smelled something smoking and I looked down and I was smoking. The team called for a medivac, a medical evacuation via helicopter based at Salerno, uh, Afghanistan, but did not tell the crew that Moss had a live RPG lodged in his abdomen for fear that the crew would not want to transport him. So I did a little bit of research into this. And uh, here's a photo of the x-ray. So when this... Oh, uh, that's not it. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, everybody. Uh, I, but you know what? I can whip it up here. Um, the the photo of the X ray is right here. So when this happens in um, in war, when, and it and it hap- it's happened, I guess, like a, a number of times. Um, wow, really? Soldiers are typically put in a room and basically treated as though they will. Uh, they're terminal and that there's no saving them because they are such a risk and the surgery is so mm-hmm. difficult and there's no saying like whether or not this thing will fucking go off. So if you're not on YouTube, I uh, highly suggest you go over there. There's some crazy shit that I'm about to show you, you all. Um, but what we're looking at right now, this is the X-ray of the RPG inside his abdomen. Um, kind of hard to make it out here. So what I will do is I'll first show you the animation of what actually happened that day. So Whoa, you the have that? RPG came in, impaled through his hip bone, went through his hip, up through his abdomen, oh. and out the oh. other side. Whoa. Here's a diagram here. So you can see the RPG went through, um, went through his hip. The shaft of it came all the way through and out the other side. You can see his pelvis... You can see the entire the entire uh, RPG there, Whoa. and so pretty fucking wild, right? So, um, uh, an RPG, a mini missile around the length of a cricket bat, had entered through one side of Moss's hips, and its tip, a large grenade, was protruding from his opposite hip. So, kind of like came up and like on an angle through. So it it looked almost like it might not have quite hit any like really important organs. I guess is that why he was like still well, able to live. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Jesus we'll get Christ. there. Uh, somehow it had not detonated on impact, but if it exploded, it would kill everyone within a thirty foot radius. So like these are big, Whoa. big, big explosions. In the first two major strokes of luck, the convoy's only medic, Jared Angle was in the vehicle with Moss and, and able to treat him immediately, bandaging his wounds and s- stabilizing the RPG to ensure it didn't move around. The Blackhawk Black Hawk helicopter had to wait for the fighting on the ground to cease before they could land, which meant a long delay taking Moss outside of the golden hour, quote, golden hour for trauma treatment that saved so many lives. When the helicopter landed, the crew could see immediately what had happened to Moss and knew that he should not be rescued. The U.S. Army policy in such situations states Moss should ha- not have been transported because it could lead to the death of four medevac crew members, three other three other wounded soldiers, and the loss of a helicopter. <clears throat> However, the well, flight crew confer- uh, conferred and all agreed to take Moss. So they were like, you know what? Fuck this. Like, we could save this guy's life. Let's do it. They flew dude, him to the nearest... Goosebumps. I know. They flew him to the nearest field hospital uh, at the Oregon E base. But the actual that bit, but again, the crucial unexploded detail of his injury was omitted. Sorry, but again, the crucial unexploded detail of his injury was omitted. So they still didn't say like, "Yo, this is a live RPG." When he got to the hospital, oh. once at the hospital, the medical team, led by surgeons Major John O and Major Kevin Kirk, were confronted with the wound. "Quote: It had fins coming out of the left side of his body and a huge, uh, big bulge in the front of his right thigh." said Major Kirk. Again, U.S. Army police states that Moss should not be operated on because of the risk to medics and other patients. Moss's second major stroke of luck came when a bomb disposal expert, Staff Sergeant Dan Brown, was on the base. Brown explained the possible scenarios to the medical team, including the possibility that they could all become pink mist if the grenade exploded and they agreed to treat him. Whoa. That's such an aggressive descriptor. That is such a wild fucking statement. Um, By this point, Moss's heart had stopped due to the massive blood loss and the medics had to administer uh, uh, epinephrine. 
Thank you. To mm-hmm. restart the organ before they could operate. Uh, Sergeant Brown used a hacksaw to remove the RPG tail fin and very slowly eased the rocket back out through the entry wound. Brown then walked the unexploded bomb out of the operating theater to a bunker to detonate it. Moss was transferred to hospitals in Afghanistan and Germany en route to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, where he was reunited with his wife, Lorena, and his daughters, uh, Juliana and Ariana, now six and four. Moss's internal organs were severely damaged and he had suffered a shattered pelvis, leaving him unable to walk. He had four major operations and years of grueling physiotherapy that took him out of a wheelchair onto a walking frame and then to walking with a cane. He made pretty much a full recovery. So here's the wild, 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 wild thing. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that wasn't it. (laughs) Everything everything up to this point has been child's play. Yeah. I'm going to show you footage of the surgery. Stop. So this is, uh, 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 talking over this is Major Kirk, the surgeon who pulled the RPG out and out of the room. Captain Kirk? It was a feeling of tension, of course, but of amazement at the same time that we were able to be involved in doing something like this, of removing an RPG from a person that was still alive. Our whole thought the entire time was how to keep, keep Cheney Moss alive. The moment until I had that RPG out of, outside of Cheney Moss, it was complete silence. I was inside myself. I was knowing what I was doing and it had no distractions until the moment that that RPG was out of my hands. Then that's when the world came back into play and it was like just a vacuum was released and all the noise, all the commotion. And I, I just sat down and I started shaking. Oh. Uh, it was... Wow. It's like giving birth. Whoa. Complete release. Just complete wow. amazement and release at the same time and oh my god, we just we just finished something that saved a kid's life. Wow. Oh dude. That makes me cry, man. That's yeah. crazy. Pretty wild, eh? Like just the uh, the cuz then they got to get rid of like, it. Like Immediately. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the fact that so many people like put their lives on the line to like save that guy's life, knowing that they could all fucking turn into pink mist. Like, and also knowing that like, it's he crazy. still might not make it. Like the guy's fucking heart stopped and they were like, let's still get this thing out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty wild. And yeah. I, I did a little more research, but like while reading this article about times that this has uh, had happened in the past, there's several times where, Soldiers have had unexploded explosives lodged into their bodies. And um, again, sometimes they just leave them. Sometimes they save them, bring them to a place and leave them in a room and just like can't touch them. There's been cases of um, soldiers receiving surgery on the other side of, of sandbags that have been packed like six feet high and the Whoa. and the surgeons are reaching through the sandbags to do the surgery in case it blows up. I mean, it's just wild, wild, wild shit. And it's again, it's like it's just a reminder of of how how especially watching a video like that. You know, it's like we we hear about war going on in in different parts of the world, and and it's it, it's it's become such a part of our like. It's just and such we glorified a, in it yeah, with video games, video games all that kind of shit, right? And it's like you, you, it really is. It really is hard to comprehend how fucking insanely traumatic and fucked up um, the act of war really is. And so to see mm-hmm. something like this is just really astounding. Major kudos to the to the entire team that uh, were behind saving saving um, Moss's life. He he recovered well enough to attend college in Georgia. And uh, and the soldiers in the medical team who helped save Private Moss, they were also honored pretty highly. So, wow, wow, that's a crazy story. Isn't that crazy? That is a crazy yeah, fucking story. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that is totally bonkers. Well, that concludes this week's. Oh, Brian's Brian needs a Brian needs a break. <laughs> Brian, I know. Brian, like, I know. Brian, do you want to play stress. Warzone after this? What do you think? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to now walk around and just try to like compassionately care for everybody in the game instead of shooting them with rocket launchers. <laughs> yeah. Right. Who needs help? Does anybody need help? 
Um, uh, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate each and every one of you, whether you're uh, listening at home via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the CBC Listen app, or perhaps just watching the Feel Good Friday episodes on your couch, on YouTube, uh, whoever you are, wherever you are, we appreciate you. We love you, um, but we don't appreciate you or love you nearly as much as we do our patrons, our sweet, sweet potato patrons, uh, because those folks, we reserve yeah, a clear, most of our love for them. Mm-hmm. Clear divide. Clear mm-hmm. divide. And uh, uh, sorry, Jer, I, I feel like you were passing the baton to me there, but then I, then I realized that it felt like you didn't finish off the things that you usually say, but you're nodding at me now, so... I'll go into it. If you want to send us uh, any love, if you want to send us uh, some cool stories, um, you know, um, I think the joke's played out now, but um, manifestos are welcome. Letters at sickboypodcast.com. And uh, if you want to be on the show, you can go to sickboypodcast.com slash contact, fill out the form, and uh, maybe we'll have you on the show. I mean, if, you had a, if you've ever had a, an RPG, you know, fucking lodged in your abdomen, like <sighs> reply now. Like yeah, you're going to definitely. the top of the list. Sorry to everybody else, but like don't, RPG don't sleep stomach, on it. <laughs> top of the list. Yeah, don't sleep on it for no. sure. <laughs> um and uh and just letting everybody know that we are selling merch right now. You can get uh some cool sick boy swag at shop.sickboypodcast.com. If you're a patron, then you actually get a discount uh code as well. So and we're creating some custom Patreon patron merch right now. So mm-hmm. stay tuned for some of that. Uh, but other than that, uh, a big thank you to the people who make this show happen. That would be Lauren Sankey, Tiller McGilvery, Jeremy Saunders, and me. And a huge thank you to our manager, Jeff Lonis, to the people who do the theme music on our various episodes, Rich O'Coin, Take Part, uh, Kenneth Copeland and Company. And, uh, <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, and a huge thank you to Donovan, the Meerkat Morgan. We love you all. That is it for this week. I'm Brian. I'm Taylor. I'm Lauren. And I'm Jeremy. And this is Sick Boy. <laughs>